Hi there, welcome to CHMR 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland. I'm Dave Fort, your host on Dual Citizen. Um, I've got a very uh, interesting guest here, a documentarian, Andrew Gregg, uh, who just did um, the documentary for, or just uh, on the documentary channel. They just aired yes. it on Saturday, January 16th, Sky Master Down. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, uh, I'll get Andrew to explain it more. It's, it's about a uh, air, air crash mystery uh, in the 50s, in 1950s specifically. Why don't you tell us a bit about the premise of Sky Master Down, Andrew? Yeah, on January 26, 1950, um, uh, Douglas C-54 Skymaster troop plane uh, was leaving Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage, Alaska. It was a regular, regular flight path uh, along the Northwest Staging Route, took them all the way down to Great Falls, Montana where everybody on the plane would disperse and catch other flights to go home around the lower 48 states. Um, it, uh, this was pre-radar, so uh, the flight crew had to check in every half hour at uh, re remote radio stations uh, set along the ground. Um, as soon as it crossed into Canadian airspace in the Yukon, the first of those remote stations was a place called Snag that's now abandoned, but um, they radioed in there they said that uh, everything was fine. They gave their altitude, said there was a little bit of ice on the wings. And then after that, they were never heard from again. Um, the next uh, place to check in was another half hour um, south uh, east at a place called Ashak. And they were never heard from there, never heard from in Whitehorse or all the way down the line. So um, pretty quickly, a uh, huge uh, search and rescue operation was staged. Um, the Americans came down from Anchorage and set up a uh, command post in Whitehorse, and and then all hell broke loose. Right, and I, I uh, one of the there's so many fascinating things about this documentary. Actually, like you know, just the the mystery of, of going missing in the north. Uh, one of the things early on is your documentary did a really good job of describing how the the intricacies in 1950 of, of how. So, right, they were in Snag, the report would have went to Snag, then over, and I believe then they had a way of getting the information to Edmonton. Yes. There, there, there was a, quite a, a telephone network, um, a very intricate network of getting the information pre-computer age, I guess, um, which I, I thought was very intricate. And it seemed like it was very relatively new in, in, in its design. And uh, is that true? Or Well, if you think about it, you know, um, Pre-1942, yep. the Yukon was, a, was really, um, um, as far as the outside world is concerned, sort of a forgotten place. Yep. It had um, um, stern wheelers uh, going up and down the Yukon River from the time of the gold rush. So Whitehorse had a busy waterfront with the stern wheelers, and it also had a train coming up from Skagway. But the, you know, unless you wanted to go overland on some bumpy trails, there was no road. So when the... Um, Japanese landed in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska in, after Pearl Harbor was attacked. The Americans realized that they had a domestic front in the Second World War in Alaska, and they had to, they had to get up there and provide it with munitions, build forts, Air Force bases. Like They had to basically mobilize quickly. So they put in the Alaska Highway, which was an incredible engineering feat that, got, um, that opened up the, the north, including the Yukon. The Yukon was never the same again after the Alaska right. Highway went through. And along with the highway came the Northwest Staging Route, which was a highway through the sky, and all the telephone and telegraph and telex that came in um, you know, along the highway. So you're thinking by 1950, all of that is less than eight years old. Right. Uh, and, and the other thing that always surprises me too is that motorized flight was only 47 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, that it was 47 years from the time of the Wright brothers flying a rickety glider with a bicycle engine to a full <laughs> plane massive airplane with 44 people on board flying through the Arctic winter. I mean, you know, um, it, it's incredible technological advancement on one hand. On the other hand, we all also kind of got ahead of ourselves. So yeah. The, the, yeah, there was a lot of danger involved with with flying in these conditions at that time. That's right, and and so the the, the that particular plane that you described, the Skymaster, uh, down went down, and forty four people were lost, and it, it they tried for weeks um, with, with other airplanes, and kind of they they went with the mo of let's go with the high flying airplanes, and some of those crashed in the searching. 
right? Am I correct? So it was, yeah, four of them did. Yeah, and two of the two of the wrecks are still out there. Right. Um, yeah, you know, it was a it was a mess because search and rescue as a sort of a discipline uh, wasn't really there yet. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, from from an aerial point of view. So you're talking about the winter. Um, at the same time, I should mention on January 26, 1950, at the same time the plane went missing, there were war games, winter wow. war games that were already planned for the Yukon between the U.S. and the Canadians. So there were thousands of people with equipment and planes already in the territory, and they carried on with their war games while the search was going on, too. So imagine yourself in the search and rescue headquarters in Whitehorse, and you're getting phone calls from Yukoners because they've seen a flare or a parachute right more than likely from the war games as opposed to the missing airplane right so you've got um the command center saying we got to check everything you go north and you go east you know and they had planes going off willy-nilly all over the place without really a sort of a uh, a familiar grid system set up that we know we've covered this grid let's move on to the next grid it wasn't really organized that way right and as you said you know there were there were big airplanes with small porthole windows it's like like c-47s also known as dc-3s and low slung wings so you couldn't really have a good view of the ground right so they it wasn't ideal at all it was just sort of throw people at it throw machines at it and hope for the best yeah and yeah. there was uh one, one really interesting part of the documentary I, 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 there was a trapper who said he saw well it heard a big boom and then kind of a slide and then he saw um kind of uh, not predator um uh, scavenger birds scavenger birds in in the area and he, he kind of phoned it in or said hey this might be a good area to look and they they didn't really take the the trapper the first nations trapper's word too strongly i i, yeah, and I that thought was, that was one of the maybe the better theories <laughs> oh i think i think it's yeah i i'm um you know like the where the plane went missing the area is uh it's kind of shared between the white river first nation the kuwani first nation and, okay. and to its to another extent the the champagne ashak first nation but Albert um, Isaac, who we're talking about, he uh, he was Kluwani First Nation out of a little town called Burwash Landing. But he'd been out of his trap line for a while. He didn't know anything had happened. Um, he just heard this bang, saw the signs of a snow slide and the scavenger birds hanging around the trees. So when he went back to town, he went and told the RCMP about it and gave an official report. And the RCMP flew out and circled the area, which is called Gladstone Creek area. And uh, they didn't see anything. And that was it. They didn't. Uh, I know that the, the, the RCMP at the time uh, were going to go and do a foot, uh, an expedition on foot. But that time of year with no real expertise in the Yukon wilderness, plus they had to cross the ice of Kluwani Lake. It was a pretty major undertaking. And they realized this just isn't going to work. Right. But we do talk to Albert Isaac, the, that fellow that reported what he saw. We talked to his granddaughter, who's still in Burwash Landing. Mary oh, wow. Jane yeah. yeah. And um, she she said, basically, you know, if they'd come to us, yeah, uh, we would have gone out on foot. We know this land. We probably would have done a better job than a bunch of airplanes flying around and crashing. For sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Def- definitely. A little, little, yeah. little more pragmatic, but probably get to get to what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, so that pretty, um, another um, Skymaster Down, uh, which just aired on the documentary channel. Um, and uh, we'll get into how maybe people can view it uh, now that they've heard this interview. Um, one thing that it evoked for me was, well, mystery and, and the concept of closure. I've always been really fascinated with the concept of closure because you, you hear of like family stories um, and that, and like you, you technically know someone's gone or like you technically know the truth, but there's something in our humanity um, that almost demands closure. And this is 70 years later now. And uh, some of the, the the children who were maybe five of the family, or uh, there was one woman who was still in the womb at the time, and that when her yeah, father two actually two two women two, in the yeah. story that were so, still the moms were still pregnant with them. And these families are still looking for closure, and I, I'm always fascinated with that. I, I I guess I've never had an experience where I've had to yearn for that, um, and I, I I see it repetitively. So I obviously know it's it's part of our human intuition. Let's 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 talk about it a bit. Why why do we need that closure what's what's important for our spirituality and then maybe even the, the spirits that have died went on why, why do we need closure what's the importance of that it's really it, it, this morning i was listening i had cbc radio on this morning and they were yeah. talking i didn't catch the whole story but they were talking about somebody that had been missing for 30 years 
and they were talking to the parents and and one of the parents said i just keep i know i know this i know my son is going to come walking through the door one day and we heard that from everybody um whether directly you know from one of the children of the missing or or when they were talking about their moms who were left you know without a husband instantly suddenly yeah. tragically and um so what most of them their their parents died without uh knowing anything yeah. died without an answer and what that means as far as what i've been told by these people is that there are just giant holes in sort of the family story and the family lore and yeah. and there's stories that just can't be can't be solved you know um it's like uh a missing in action soldier from the war you know um never been found and the assumption is that the soldier died in, in battle and that there's a memorial somewhere and maybe some people can take solace from that in this case there's nothing like it, it, there's not even a rivet that's yeah. officially been found and it's just that needing to know the, the 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 tragic sort of what's the what's the best the you know the, the, those 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 family ties those family memories are suddenly cut and i think in military families from what i've learned if, if they know if their loved one is going off to battle that's one thing these people were just on a regular ferrying flight right, right? There, 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 there shouldn't have been any danger and 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 on top of that there's this feeling that they were still, even though it was a ferrying flight, they're still serving their country. They're, they're, they were on that, everybody on that flight, except for one woman and her child, everybody was a military man. Mm -hmm. And and the families are sort of, it's a combination of closure, but also frustration that their own military hasn't done more. They went out and did that initial search. Mm -hmm. And in the official search report, they they suggest that we come back after the weather gets better. They never went back. 72 years later, they never went back. And so you've got a combination of not just needing closure, but frustration. And in some cases, outright anger. Right. Um, the more they find out. I mean, this story has been dormant for a long time. The, you know, I can't, I, I stumbled across it in 2018 and um, I couldn't believe I didn't know about it already. Right. And then I found out most people don't know about it either, including you, Connors. Uh, but for these families, it's all fresh. And I think it's a combination, as I say, of that closure, but also anger and frustration. Right. So they're looking for an end to all those things. And so there's a pilot, uh, Jer Jerry, I believe. Um, Jerry Whitley, yeah. Yeah, who kind of re got the, the search going again and kind of co-opted it with uh, training other people, um, modern day or northern uh, search and rescue, which so kind of applying uh, techniques to it. So it's a training module, but also using uh, this particular flight um, for that training module, which I thought was really interesting and a good way to go about it. Yeah, yeah and I, what I wanted to do is that um, the families who are spread out across the states and around the world have never actually met any of the people in the Yukon that continue to search. And they're a, they're a small but dedicated group. And, you know, they've got a little bit of money every summer to pay for fuel for training flights. Right. And so they use that time. Since they're up training anyway, they use that time to go looking for the Sky Master. And um, that's it. Those are the only people looking. I mean, there are lots of people on Google Earth in their basements sending in um, <laughs> right. all, sorts, all sorts of theories. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I never even thought of that. Right. There's a lot of theories. Um, but, you know, in absence of fact, then people will fill in the blanks. Right. right. And, um, but other than that, there's just this group in Whitehorse and they're so dedicated. And I felt that they needed to be really heralded and involved in this story, too. And I wanted the families on screen to be able to see who these people are, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, so, you know, it's kind of a balance between the families waiting for answers and the small dedicated group of people out there striving for answers. But in the, in the middle of it all, is this mystery that this plane just won't be found. Do you have a particular theory that you're, uh, you're akin to? Yeah, I've been through, there are three, there are three kind of standard theories that any of people in these groups <laughs> talk about. And, and one is that it's still out along the flight path somewhere. Um, at first, I thought, well, that seems plausible, but then I learned more about that part of the Yukon. And, and even though there's no communities out there, it's constantly crisscrossed by First Nations trappers, hunters, uh, outfitters, geologists, miners, trekkers. Like it's, it's, it's a heavily trafficked area. Right. And, and it's very, very, very beautiful. 
And so, yeah, you know, yes, people are back. I want to just stop you there for a sec there uh, for people who are going to tune in and you should uh, tune into Sky Master Down on the documentary channel. Incredible, uh, incredible Yukon, Alaska uh, footage um, and backdrop. <laughs> so very, very good cinematography on that. And so sorry. Well, the tremendous, uh, tremendous white horse based crew. Yeah. Yeah. Neil McDonald and, and uh, Mike Code. Yeah. Okay. They were just incredible. Yeah. And, and so I don't think it's along the flight path. The other theory is that it went into a lake. Um, and there, is, there are a few large lakes along the route. We actually side scanned sonar one lake for four days, but didn't find anything. Um, but the, the problem with the lake theory is that in order for a, a plane to punch through January ice, which is already pretty thick, yeah. you have to be going screaming fast. And the noise, even though the area is kind of remote, the noise would have been like what Albert Isaac heard, right? right. It would have been deafening. And uh, so I think what happened, I mean, this is the theory I'm with now, and I, I could, I reserve the right to change it next week, but yeah. <laughs> I think what happened is um, we did meet a, um, he's in the film, we, a, a radio operator from Snag who was there that day in 1950, and he's still alive living in Ottawa. He told oh, me wow. that, he told me that um, sometimes these crews, which were mainly based in the Southern States, um, this particular crew was from El Paso. Um, they, they thought they knew better than the navigators and the people that laid out the Northwest Station, and they thought we could take a shortcut and uh, save some time. Yes. And if you if you do that, if you peer off to the south or to the southwest, pretty short order, you're in the biggest mountains in North America. Okay. Um, the, there's literally a wa- a rock wall behind the behind the town of Barwash Landing of the Saint Elias Ranch. And if, it, if that was cloud covered with cloud, you're flying in tough winter conditions. You could fly into that cloud with a rock face on the other side and have no clue what's coming for you. And I think that's what happened. And I think that's what happened because whatever happened, I think happened quickly. Um, the, po- the, 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 uh, the radio operator did have an SOS button right on his console that he could have hit. Right. And he never did. There was no radio contact, nothing just whatever happened happened really fast they slammed a mountain like that just came out of the clouds like that that's 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 my feeling you're right that's my feeling and there are other analogous uh crashes in alaska where that exact same thing happened it's actually a term for it called a controlled flight into terrain okay controlled flight into terrain yeah. Okay, well, I don't, uh, for people listening, I, I, I don't want to give away any any spoilers. Um, <laughs> um, we got Andrew Gregg, uh, Skymaster down. It really is, uh, if you like mystery, um, if, if yeah, story, if you like military stories, it's a military story. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it harkens true to the now, to the, the no one left behind concepts. Um, yeah, and just a, a wide range of people involved and still involved to this day. And and it's also a, it's also a, a northern story, you know. Yeah. I wanted to. Um, I'm a former Yukoner myself. Okay. And I go back a lot, and I really wanted the landscape to play a large part in the film. And I think you know you get that that as beautiful it is as it is, it's also dangerous if you if you don't take it seriously. Yes, it it's, it sounds like it's supposed to be taken taken very seriously. So Sky Master down on on the documentary channel. Um, yes. Andrew Greg. Um, Andrew, do you have any uh, music uh, you want to send us out with? Uh, um, yeah, I would say uh, um, uh, there's a song by a, a Yukon performer. Her name is Diet. Diet? How do you spell that? D I Y E T. And she's got a band called Diet and the Love Soldiers. Diet and the Love Soldiers. Love it. Yeah. And she lends her voice to the soundtrack. And okay. Albert. Albert Isaac is her great grandfather. Oh my! Indeed, we'll play that. And and her mother is Mary Jane Johnson, who's in the film. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Brave Face by uh, Diane. Okay. And as far as your your documentary work, is there there anything we can look forward to in the future besides Sky Master Down from Andrew Gregg? We're going to try to keep following this story. Okay. So we can... yeah, and we're working actually on some other unsolved crashes in Alaska that happened around the same time. Okay. Um, it seems that the the basically the working theory is that the Skymaster wasn't the only one left behind. Um, that the U.S. government has a very quiet policy that they don't broadcast. That if that same plane and those same people went down in a theater of war, there would have been all effort to go recover them. But because it happened outside of the theater of war, it was basically a 
just traveling uh, is considered an operational loss. So all those families that think mm -hmm. the government that they're looking for their loved ones, they're not. Right. Got it. And I think a lot of people from uh, right here in St. John's can relate to the like the the, the great mysteries of, of ships and boats gone oh, missing yeah. over and the years. And all the planes so, that came through there in the Second World War too. That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah they, I think they. Found, I don't know when they got the radar at the St. John's Airport, but not too long ago. So it, it's something else to fly around here too. So I think it's a very relatable yeah. story to the region. Uh, we look forward Good. to having you back then, Andrew, uh, to give us more info. Uh, please feel free uh, to uh, update us on this and and any new releases you have in the future. Okay, my pleasure. I really no enjoyed problem, this. Andrew. And we'll go with Diet and the Love Soldiers here. This, uh, this song that I want to do for you, or we want to do for you, Fearless Heart, was a song that I wrote about the experience of growing up across the lake. We lived in a really tiny cabin, and it was old when we moved in there. You know, it was my my mom and dad, my sister and my brother and I. And um, those memories of living there, I can still smell that cabin. I can uh, still smell the trees when I go there now. And I think that, that we're born with many languages and that you know, nature and land speak to us all differently. And uh, this is how this one was interpreted. This land's a never changing mass of rock and tree, water and dirt. I've been gone so long, seems my old home's been swallowed by the earth. The damp and cold has taken hold, forgotten toys become iron and rust. It was so many years ago. Memories slowly turn to dust Ooh, Never thought I'd find my way back to this place I've come back to find you, find you, find you And tell you everything's gonna be okay uh, ooh, Yesterdays I'd never change And in this crumbling shelter Left as it is It's part of a story not finished yet Its lines are carved in the wood So deep we won't forget Play. 
This song that I want to sing is called Asia Kei, and it's actually a song that her and I, the first time that we wrote together, uh, it's our first attempt at it. And I was really scared because I was just beginning to learn the language again. And um, I was asked to write a song in Southern Dishoni, and I, I talked to her about it, and she said, you can do this. I said, I don't think so, Grandma. I'm really scared to do it. And she said, you can't be scared. You can't be scared to speak your language because it's your, it is your language. And uh, we worked through this song, and it, they were her words. And it was, became her story in this song. And uh, Asia Keyi means my grandfather's country, and that's what we call our home. And she talked about how, for many years, that land was taken from us. And how, how the people cried for that land, because it's like grandfather. But then she, she said, you know, the land came back, and I'm happy again. And I won't cry anymore. Asia Kei Let it shink To Kano Tadu Hey ya Hey ya Asia Kei To Chai Na Kotsa Ting Ang Yet to say na ya Uha yet to say na ya Asia Kay Na Kochani Cheese. 